Hello everybody and welcome to this week's lecture. It's basically going to be a lecture that's specific to two artists uh, that we're covering this week, Hieronymus Bosch and Hans Hobbein. And so we're going to just spend the majority of this mini lecture on basically two uh, key paintings from these two figures, uh, which will hopefully, um, uh, hopefully the Blackboard page and the videos I've posted will give you a nice context for where these two artists are coming from. Because there's a lot, the reason why I wanted to focus on these two paintings is because there's so much symbolism here within both of these. Um, and when we look north to northern artists, we see that uh, the the kind of Renaissance uh, interest in um, symbolism, which we talked much, a lot about last week, is something that the northern artists really enjoy as well. And so we'll look uh, first at our map here to the north, and it's important. This is basically a, a map that was created. Um, to show us the changes that were happening during the Reformation. So the Protestant Reformation is a very important key um, kind of event that's happening at this time in history. Um, this map is from 1560. Um, there is a video that I posted that's kind of an introduction from the Khan Academy um, on uh, the, the Protestant Reformation. It talks about Martin Luther and his key role that he, he played in uh, posting the 95 Theses. So you get to hear all about that in that lecture. He was basically a monk who um, was really unhappy with the Holy Roman uh, Catholic Church, um, specifically because they accepted in what, we, what we would call indulgences. Um, and you'll get more in the video, but basically this was a way for rich people to pay their way into heaven. So the idea was that uh, once you died, you spent time in purgatory um, while you kind of uh, were assessed for your sins before you either made it to heaven or hell. Um, but at this time in history, the, the Holy Roman Church started um, accepting money from people to buy these indulgences, and basically that would give you a free pass to go straight to heaven and uh, bypass purgatory entirely. So you had um, rich people, you know, under the impression that they could uh, buy their way into heaven, and then of course, where does that leave the poor population? Um, and uh, on top of all that, here we have uh, the complete corruption of the church at this time. So we know obviously that this money didn't do anything for people after they died, right? Um, all this money uh, just went into the hands of of the church itself uh, and made the church quite rich. So um, this is the key thing that Martin Luther was against. Um, but I won't go into it too much, but there is uh, a video I posted and then there's a couple more that you can find on Khan Academy that are right after the one I posted if you want a much broader context about that. And that will help you to kind of understand the context of the things that come up in your chapter this week. But basically I want us to look north. So right now we're going to talk about two artists who are from uh, one Swiss artist, uh, Halbein, who is actually working in England at the time when he did the painting we're going to talk about, uh, the French ambassadors, and um, we're also going to talk about Hieronymus Bosch. So he's another artist who's a German artist, so also living in Northern Europe, um, and you can see here both of these artists were coming from an area where Lutheranism had become the norm. But I wanted to start with Hieronymus Bosch. Um, here's kind of an image of him, so you can get an idea of kind of what he looked like. Um, we're going to look at his triptych today. And if you might recall, triptychs are basically usually used as altarpieces. So throughout the lessons and the book so far, basically every time we've seen a triptych, it's been an altarpiece in a church. You know, a three-part painting that closes and opens. But Bosch did something kind of different with this. Um, he used the format of the altarpiece, or I'm sorry, the triptych, the three-part painting that closes and opens, but made it completely secular. So this was something that was very new, um, and we'll see how he does that in just a second. All right, and then the other thing I wanted to mention um, was that we actually see 
an image of God the Creator here as well. So if we close the triptych, so here's the closed version. Um, we have an image of God the Creator ho hovering here in a bubble. So this is just a detail of the work. If you look over here, it co uh, coincides right with um, the bubble that you see represented here. Um, and he's got a little book in his hand. He's got a crown. But it's not super typical to actually see um, God the Creator represented, right? Usually we would see his hand, um, something like that, uh, something a little bit more abstract. But here we actually do have that um, here. Um, and then I'll, we'll talk about this inscription in just a second as well as we move inside uh, the triptych. I also wanted to note that the choice of this triptych is actually somewhat ironic. So right, I talked about how um, usually triptychs are altarpieces only, um, but this one of course was commissioned for an aristocrat's home, so it's actually made for someone, uh, someone's uh, domestic dwelling space, so um, it's a little bit ironic because typically this would be a religious painting, um, but we'll look at the ways that maybe it's, it becomes kind of satirical instead. So here's the painting when we open the painting. Uh, as I said, it's of course a triptych, so here's the central panel. These are the out exterior panels that would close up, creating this uh, the closed triptych here with the image. So basically, um, the left wing represents Adam and Eve, and we'll look at these figures more in detail in just a second. You can see Adam and Eve, and again, another personification of God. The central um, basically shows humans reveling in earthly goods, they've got fruits, there's all sorts of animals, and we'll take a look specifically at what's happening there in just a second. And then on the right panel we see sensual pleasures um, as instruments of dark torture. So in some ways we have the beginning, um, the middle, and the end um, representing, you know, creation uh, with Adam and Eve, and then we have kind of uh, folly and vices, you know, the, the crazy things that humans will do in the center, and then we have consequences for those things here in the final panel, which is supposed to represent some sort of hell. And so here's just another image to show you what the triptych would look like open and closed. And first we'll talk a tiny bit about the outside. Um, so basically here we have um, a sphere that you see here. It's basically half covered uh, the under half seems to be uh, water, and that might be some uh, art historians and some scholars have talked about that as being connected to the floods in the Bible, but that's just kind of uh, speculation. We're not really sure why uh, we see the water in the sphere here. But I do want to again draw your attention to the tiny god up here at the, at the top left holding a book, and then right next to him you see this inscription which takes place on both, in, uh, both panels. It translates to, for he spoke, and it came to be, he commanded, and it stood firm. And that's from Psalms 33, uh, 9. And so, you know, our, people have speculated as to what this means. It could mean a lot of things. It could have much to do with kind of uh, the flooding of the earth as a cleansing of vices. But honestly, we're just really not sure. But that's what we have on the outside. When we go to the inside, we'll start with the panel on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left. So here I've kind of cut the uh, triptych in half to show you the central and then this left side panel. And I've zoomed into a little detail here to actually show you what's happening. So here we have um, God introducing Adam and Eve to one another in what we might call the Garden of Eden. Okay, so this is basically taking uh, the scene right from the Bible. It suggests not only God's ability to create, right? These are um, his finest creations, the human body. But it also suggests the human's ability uh, to procreate, right? We understand that uh, after... Um, and we have the tree here um, with the fruit on it, and we understand that after Adam and Eve meet, you know, um, they, they take, um, they eat some of the forbidden fruit, giving them sight, and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose, and they're attracted to one another, right, and then they begin procreating, and, um, and the rest is history. Um, so here we have um, the initial kind of opening of the of the scene right here, and if you look directly above God, 
you see this amazing fountain and I will also have you notice kind of how surreal this scene is and how you'll see as we look through the whole painting how surreal the whole painting becomes. Um, it's all this kind of crazy stuff here. Uh, these these are pretty typical animals right now but when we move to the next panel you'll see a wide array of these very kind of random odd animals um, that are very surrealistic. But if we look up, I've zoomed in, right in this fountain you can see a tiny owl. And so the owl is a symbol of wisdom, but the owl was also used at this time in history as a symbol, so this is uh, symbolism, right, as a symbol of folly. And so the watchful eye of the owl overlooks the, you know, Adam and Eve's introduction, of course, uh, in some ways foreshadowing the future, which will be, of course, um, the, uh, represented in the next two panels. And then we move on to the central panel, we see scenes like this. And so it's it's almost impossible to go through and look specifically at everything. Because as you see here in the painting, I mean this is a very dense painting. Um, but I'll just bring you through a few of these um, to kind of get you thinking about what's happening in, this, in the second panel. So basically we see a range of naked humans representing in some ways uh, uh, the offspring of Adam and Eve, right? Um, perhaps warning us against lust and folly, as we saw with the owl, right? This symbol of folly that we have here. Um, they also, uh, some scholars have also suggested that the kind of crazy scenes that you're seeing here um, are a symbolic of this idea that man is much more similar to animals and plants than, than we think, right? Um, because here you see um, man enacting kind of animalistic behavior. You also see uh, allusions to sensuality, sexuality, but you never see intercourse. Um, but you also see a range of animals kind of uh, having intimate moments with humans. Um, humans are swimming through the water, right? This plant. Uh, sort of births this um, um, egg with these two humans in it. And so there's really a lot of crazy stuff going going on here. And just moving on, here again you see a, a range of uh, naked humans holding up this bird-like figure, again alluding to the surrealistic, kind of almost nightmarish, dream-like quality of some of the ideas that uh, uh, Bosch was coming up with at this time, but oftentimes you see humans in eggs, humans in shells, being hatched as animals, uh, being fed by birds, and then you have these weird creatures that kind of um, are throughout the painting. So um, this could perhaps also be a contemplation of man's place in nature. So where does man actually stand in terms of nature? That's what other uh, scholars have said. Um, but overall there's a real interest in kind of the uh, visualizing hallucinations or like uh, a type of hallucin uh, uh, one's uh, subconscious being visualized. Um, so that's another way that we see that Bosch is very unique because he's kind of working with surrealist tendencies long before the actual surrealists um, the, uh, the, of the surrealist movement um, came to the fore. Now I want to move um, to the third panel. So here we again have the cent central panel um, and then we have the third panel represented here. This is basically supposed to represent hell or um, you know some sort of fiery dark place. You notice um, that it's much darker, right? The first two panels were had this natural light, were very bright, and now we have a dark space. Um, if you, I'll move this over a little bit. Um, if you see here, there's fire burning, it's smoke. Um, there's a wall depicted here, which almost seems to be kind of a prison wall, uh, holding everybody in, um, in this hellish space. Everything is black. Um, and throughout the painting, you see a variety of strange tor torture techniques, which are often um, um, practiced or done by animal, some sort of animal demon. Um, you know, we had these kind of weird animals in the second panel, and here again we have them again. 
Uh, but this time they're slightly more demonic. This time they eat humans. They defecate on humans. Um, uh, they seem to grope humans in a variety of ways. Um, if we zoom in a little bit, here you see uh, just a little bit of what I'm talking about. Um, this bird creature seems to sit on a throne. He's eating humans, but there's birds coming out of the human's butt. All right, and then he seems to be defecating this kind of... Um, um, I'm sorry, uh, he seems to be excreting this kind of bubble of humans who will be falling into this pool of other humans who are being barfed on and also pooped on. So it's, I mean, if you really get in there, it's quite disturbing and really disgusting in so many ways. Um, you look at the figure here who's being kind of um, groped by this dark figure behind her. Um, and then another thing I wanted to note, you know, here you have a man who's just being eaten alive by these kind of grotesque creatures. Um, and then the last thing that I'll note is uh, an interest in instruments. And I'm trying to think, I don't know if I have an image now here. I mean, up here you do see some instruments. They seem to be used as devices of torture. And so music becomes important. And um, in some ways, hearing, right? So here we have these giant ears that have seem to be cut in half by a giant knife, pierced by an arrow, and you have these black figures and all these naked humans kind of running away uh, from, from these giant ears. And so this might be um, a reference to musical in instruments as symbols of evil. It's an evil distraction. So ears here become um, um, a metaphor for all the senses. And some have uh, talked about this as being linked to the seven deadly sins, um, one of which is, you know, that the senses will deceive thoughts um, so that uh, you might self-indulge or overconsume. So these are some of the sins, right? Overconsumption, self-indulgence, all the things that we saw represented over here, right? In the second panel, self-indulgence, overconsumption, um, now we see the consequences here in the final panel. The other thing I wanted to mention is this figure here. We have a central kind of figure um, who's also represented, let me show you just here, kind of right in the middle. Oops. And some people have um, theorized this as an actual portrait of Hieronymus Bosch himself, um, but others have said that, you know, it's can't, it can't be him at all. So really that's only speculation. Um, or perhaps it's just a representation of human consciousness throughout this all this madness. But either way, I would say the final panel here is it's moralizing, right? It becomes a warning. And so if you look through to the whole, um, the three uh, panels all together, you see how exactly this could happen. So again, we have the beginning, we have the innocence, right, before sin. Um, right before sin, and then here we have kind of sin itself uh, depicted throughout, and then we have consequence, right? Um, the fact that one will find themselves in this hellish space. And you were supposed to be scared by this. You know, if you look at figures like this and you're like terrified, that's exactly uh, the type of response that the artist and the person who commissioned this painting would have wanted. Um, so it actually works out perfectly, perfectly well in that way. Um, but then it's interesting because this painting is not one that would have been hung in a church. Typically you would see moralizing paintings like this hung up in the front of the church um, so that, you know, people who are worshiping could look and actually realize, okay, you know, what I'm doing here, worship, um, indulgences, all these other things, um, these are things that will help me to avoid the terror of the third panel, but not in this case, right? Because it was actually a private painting. It would have been in someone's household. So it would have been much more personal experience for that person um, who commissioned the painting. And that's all I really want to say about that, but I just really like this one because it really gives us a great um, amount, of, uh, to, uh, amount to talk about in terms of symbolism, um, but also because it's just absolutely mind-blowing. So. If you uh, are really interested in this piece, I recommend that you actually look into it more. Your book actually uh, offers a little bit more on it as well. There's a lot on the internet if you're interested. 
um, if you want to look more into it. And now I wanted to move to Hans Holbein um, with this amazing painting too, which is also full of symbolism. So um, Holbein was a Swiss artist. Um, this is his uh, painting, The Ambassadors, basically a depiction of two ambassadors um, who uh, were French, but they were living in England at the time. The man over on the left is Jean de Dinteville, um, who was, at the time, um, in, uh, a French ambassador, but was living in England. And then on the right, we have his friend, Georges de Selve, who was uh, also an ambassador, a French ambassador, but also was a bishop. And so the two come together here um, in the painting. And it's also important to note that um, the painter himself, Holbein, right after he did this painting, I mean, People thought this was so amazing, and it really is. I mean, look at the amazing detail and the vivid color that we see here. Um, so after this painting was completed, it's not long before the King of England, who was Henry VIII at the time, um, actually um, asked the painter to become his court painter. And so he became quite famous um, after the fact, uh, after this painting. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention right away about this painting is that it's not just about what we see, it's also about what we don't see. It's about the limits of vision in some ways. So let's first talk about what we do see. Well, basically, first we could talk about the wealth, right? Um, you could talk about the exquisite wealth of, uh, that is represented here in uh, the Dente V. His amazing fur coat, his thick fur coat, these wonderful shoes here, um, this gold necklace around his neck, his very elegant hat, just the way that his beard is trimmed. All of this represents intense wealth. And then his symbol um, uh, here, um, I'm, I say symbol in terms of the symbolism that it represents, but basically the, uh, what he's holding here is a dagger, and on it we actually have engraved his age, so he's 29, it says that on the dagger. And this is basically um, supposed to show us kind of his interest in an active lifestyle. Versus the bishop himself, who is much more modestly uh, dressed and who leans up on a book. Um, and here on the book, we also, if we had to zoom in, we'd see that the inscription on the book says his age, so he's 25. These are both pretty young men. Um, and in some ways, the book represents kind of a contemplative lifestyle. So we have an active lifestyle represented here on the left, and then a more contemplative um, lifestyle, lifestyle over on the right. Now let's look between the two figures. Um, this amazing table um, at top, we have all sorts of symbols that repre are represented. We have a globe um, of the... Uh, an, a, of the heavens, right? This is an astronomical globe. Uh, we have tools for measuring uh, the heavens. So we have telescopes, all sorts of other tools, um, t tools for measuring time. Um, so this is all about science and the heavens. And then on the bottom, we have a terrestrial globe, right? A globe of the earth. We also have a lute, hymnals, other instruments here. So these are basically representations of the earthly pleasures. So we have the heavenly kind of pleasures up here and the earthly pleasures down here. Um, and I, I also wanted to note all of these symbolizing keen intellect on behalf of the two men here. Right? These are two men who understand how to measure time and space. They understand astronomy. And astrology, they understand music and geography. Um, so that in itself is also quite a symbol of one's of intellect that we see shown here, objects of their achievements. And I specifically want to look at this lute. Look at how amazing uh, it is, the foreshortening is. This is, lutes were often used at this time when people were studying linear perspective um, as tools to kind of help one figure out how to understand um, foreshortening. And look how beautifully it's foreshortening, right? We see that it's distorted um, uh, to make it look like it's actually recessing uh, com um, correctly in space. And it is, right? It looks fantastic. So we see that um, it's not only an, uh, an allusion to, um, to music itself, 
but also to the, um, the skill of the painter. Um, right? This is not uh, a skill that all painters had at this time. If you look very closely, you can actually see that there is one string. Oh, you know, I should have done this a long time ago, sorry. Um, there is one string right here that is broken. And this is basically supposed to symbolize discord in the church at the time. Right? We know that the uh, Protestant Reformation is happening at this time. We know that Martin Luther is... Uh, uh, um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, anyway, we know that uh, Martin Luther is kind of dabbling with the Catholic Church and kind of do, uh, creating uh, Lutheranism. So there's a complete um, religious kind of discord, um, especially um, in the North, in these countries that are kind of moving away from Catholicism and towards Lutheranism. And then here we have a direct reference to Martin Luther himself. So this is a hymn that was created by Martin Luther. And because of the intense detail, we can actually read this and play it. So you could actually look it up um, on the internet. You could look up uh, this painting and uh, look up, maybe I'll try to post that later. Um, you could look up someone uh, actually playing the, um, the chords in here. Another testament to the amazing amount of detail in this painting. The other little thing that I wanted to note before we talk about this huge kind of smudge in the bottom of the painting um, is if you move your eye up here, you see a tiny little crucifix just peeking out of the, uh, the curtain. And if you zoom in, you can see it much more closely. Um, so this is kind of, you know, um, even though this painting seems to be so invested in the wealth uh, uh, not only in objects, but also in intellect of the two figures. Um, it's also, you know, quietly all about religion um, and the religion of these two men and the faith of these men. And we have that coming through in the lute, also the hymnal here, but also in the kind of quiet, um, just peak, the display of the crucifix just peeking out of the corner here, as you see um, over here. So what's actually happening with this big smudge? Let's move on. Uh, if I had you in my classroom, I'd say, okay, what does it look like to you? And many of you would maybe know what it is, and many of you maybe wouldn't. It just kind of looks like a big smudge. Well, if you look closely, and if you were to come close to the painting over onto the right side and look down at it, it would actually be a perfect representation of a skull, as you can see here. And this is what we call an anamorphic image. It's basically an image where it, it's all about your perspective. So you have to be on the side of the painting where you can't see anything else in, uh, in the correct perspective to see the skull. But while you're here in front of it, when you can see everything else perfectly, you can't make out the skull. So it's one of those images that's kind of secretive, but it only kind of comes to the fore when you position yourself in the correct way to be seeing it. And this painting was supposedly um, um, placed at the top of a stairway in uh, the person who commissioned its house. And actually, now that I, um, I want to say, actually, Jeanne de uh, Dintevi was the, the person who commissioned it. So he was the fellow over here at the, on the left side. So this would have been in his stairwell. And as you would have walked up the stairs, you would have been so close to it from this side that you would have seen the skull first, and then you would have seen the rest of the painting as you moved up the stairs. So why the skull? Well, I don't know if we've talked about it much in this class so far, um, but this, some people have talked about, um, or some scholars have uh, brought up the skull, of course, as a memento mori. Um, so basically a reminder of one's uh, the inevitability of death, right? That everything in life is transitory. All of these beautiful objects that we have here, all these objects, knowledge itself, our bodies, right? Um, all of this is temporary. And that's what the skull reminds us of, that everybody will die someday. Um, the other thing that we could talk about um, in terms of the, the skull is maybe its relation to the crucifix. So in its reference, the skull's reference to the memento mori, to the inevitability of death, 
maybe this might suggest the promise of an afterlife, like the promise of Christ's sacrifice here on the cross um, that we see here. Um, so that's just all I wanted to leave you with. I think that's, yeah, that's all I have. Um, but to, just to show you the intense kind of symbolism that you find in paintings like this, and to introduce you to the, the term memento mori, and also um, by giving you a look at the cross itself, or I'm sorry, the, the skull itself, um, as a figure that is both seen and unseen within the painting. So I hope that you enjoyed that. If you want to know more about these paintings, I highly recommend you look them up. Obviously, there's all sorts of things that are that scholars have been saying about these uh, throughout the years, and I offer just a little tiny bit of that here. Um, so please feel free to do your own research. Make sure you're still reading your books. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. I'd love to, uh, to answer any of your questions, because I know that uh, lectures like this leave um, more to question um, than not, because they can be so kind of dense at times. So please let me know if you have questions. I hope that you have a great week, and I will talk to you next week.